I'm Jack Jordan. I'm a former superintendent of Northside School District, and today we're interviewing Gloria Anderson, a longtime resident of the Northside community in the Leon Valley area. And we'd like for Gloria to tell us about um, her experiences. Uh, Gloria, how did you get to Leon Valley area and Northside School District? Well, I'll just back up. I guess I'll back up all the way to Germany. Fine. <laughs> um, first of all, my name is Gloria Clyde McCulloch, M-U-C-C-U-L-L-O-C-H. Uh, my grandparents pronounced it McCulloch and the other people but pronounce it McCulloch. But anyway, uh, that was my maiden name. And I was born at the Henry Stubing uh, Farm on August 23rd, 1919, to Hilda Stubing McCullough and uh, Clyde McCullough. Um, so I've lived in this area. I now live close to Hell Otis, but uh, you know, in the olden days, before Leon Valley was named, we were a part of Hell Otis. So I guess I'm still at home, but I live Hell Otis now, but I've have lived in Leon Valley most of my life. Uh, and most of my life is 87 years. My father immigrated, uh, my father's family immigrated uh, to the northern part of the United States, and some of them came into Texas. They were Irish and English. My great-grandfather, on my mother's side, immigrated from Bacon, Germany to New Brown, Texas with his parents and siblings when he was uh, about 18 years old. That was in 1850. He married and had six children. When Henry Jr., which was the youngest of those six children, <coughs> Uh, my grand, he, Henry is my grandfather. When he was about 13 in 1885, they moved to the farm in Leon Valley, uh, at, which is at the corner of Bandera Road and Eckert Road. Um, I think the reason that they moved to this area is because when they immigrated, to uh, New Brownfields, they were given a, a, a lot in town to build a house on, and then they were given about 10 acres in the country to either uh, farm or put cattle on they desired to do, and that's not much land. So uh, land was available in this area, so that's why they came to this area. So. Um, Eventually, he married Frances Borman, uh, a neighbor. That was right over, well, in fact, they were next door to um, the Hebner Onion home here. They were, had the farm next door. Uh, they, uh, so uh, they had nine children. My mother, Hilda, is number three of their nine children. Henry and Francis both attended school at the Little Rock School, uh, which is located near O'Connor High School today. Uh, Grandpa said that he either walked or rode a horse. And now that is quite a distance to walk. Wow. Or, or, and the grandma lived right over here, so she lived farther from the school than Grandpa did. <laughs> I guess they took them by wagon or, I mean, Grandma never did tell me how she got to school. I mean, I, I don't remember her telling me. But uh, Grandpa, I remember him telling that he rode a horse part of the time, but he said he walked a lot of times. Wow. So they had to start early. Um, as their children, now they my, my Grandpa, uh, Henry and Francis, their nine children, when they became of school age, well then, they didn't want them to have to go to, all the way to Hell Otis to school. And by that time, the other farmers around had children. So Mr. Evers, 
donated land at the corner of which is now Hebner and Evers Road um, for a school. Now remember, they, there were no roads, I mean, that was not a road, it was just a, a wagon trail or something up to the school. Just a lane. <laughs> yeah, just the, you just rode there, there was no, no road, either Evers or Hebner. But they put the school there and then the families got together and they built a, uh, a school. It, it was a pretty nice side school and they always call it the old tin school because the outside had a kind of a, a tin exterior to it. I don't know, I mean, you know, I've, I've just seen pictures of it and I don't really know much about that. But um, then they hired a teacher who taught in German and then later they uh, used English as a second language in the school. Um, so then uh, they taught to the eighth grade, they taught uh, grade through eight in this one room. I remember my mother saying that her older brother wouldn't go to school unless she went. <laughs> <laughs> So she was four years old when well, she package went. deal. <laughs> so she, she was four years old when she went to school, and she was a real intelligent lady. And I think by the time she was in the fourth grade, she was up with the eighth graders, because you were all in the same room. You know, you could, if you had your your, yeah. your work done, you could do. It. So uh, anyway, uh, in our day and time, that is really a strange thing. They paid the teacher about. Uh, $25, now I mean the, uh, the people that sent the child to this uh, private school, they paid about uh, uh, $2.50 a month per child or if uh, $7 a month if they had three children <laughs> going to the school. So they uh, uh, had the teacher came and she boarded with different families. If you boarded the teacher, you didn't have to pay anything to send your children. So uh, I know that uh, my uh, grandpa and grandma boarded a teacher at some time down the line, but I don't know when, and I don't know how they had room for her, but you know, we didn't need much room in those days. But did, did they, when they boarded them, did they provide on the room and the food? I think food. so, yeah. And, um, so uh, it then, after uh, they got a lot of students, and, they, and then I guess the uh, county realized that they needed a school in this area. So they built Leon Valley School, and it was part of the common school district of Bear County, which was tax supported. They moved the old Ever School back behind where this is sitting, back behind there, and uh, that was a teacher. The teacher lived in that school. I was in, I was in that uh, building after the teacher lived in it, you know, I mean, several times. And uh, it, it was pretty crude for what we're used to today. But for then, it was pretty good. So I started school in this school that we're sitting in right now, in the first grade in about 1926. Um, we entered the front door, which is right there, and then there was a hall. And then, it, but if you went straight forward, you went into the auditorium. And uh, the auditorium had it, and it, it was pretty nice. And it was, you know, a large room. And, but we, we used it for many things, and not only for just an auditorium. I mean, we used it for different classes and different, uh, just all kinds of things. It was kind of a get-together place. And then it had two rooms, which I'm sitting in one, and the one across to the north was where I was in the first grade. I went grade through four in that one room. And then I went, uh, uh, this, my second 
half was in this room. I went from four to eight in this room. Um, Where'd you eat lunch? We brought our lunch. Brought your lunch. Yeah, you brought and and what was fun? We all we uh, trade lunches, you know, with the kids. <laughs> They liked our sausage better, and we liked their meat sandwich better. So we would trade lunches a whole lot of times. Uh, and of course, we had his and her toilets out in the back there, kind of past that te teacher uh, house. Was, uh, and uh, so we walked to school because we were uh, within a mile of the school. And so, uh, we walked to school and walked home, and later they had us, but being we were within a mile of the school, we couldn't ride the bus. <laughs> so the within kids on the bus would wave <laughs> as they went by. And uh, so I don't know what happened, but I don't know whether it was a bus driver, or I imagine it was a rule made by the school district or something that they could pick us up. So finally we got to ride the bus. And uh, No so horse, but you got to ride the bus. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it, it was a big deal. So how far Grandpa walked to school, yeah. well that mile wasn't very far, but, yeah, but there was no traffic. If you saw a car, it, it was probably somebody knew. And uh, one thing I remember uh, on our walk home a lot of times, uh, Mr. Reby lived out in Helotus. And he would come about that time, and he would pick us up. And he was a real fine gentleman. Uh, then getting back to the school day, we had a flagpole, and we had more land out in front of the school than we do now. Uh, we had a flagpole out in the center. In the mornings, we would gather around the flagpole in front of the school and pledge allegiance. And at time, at, uh, then we would come in and the teacher would read the Bible. Uh, she would read, you know, Psalms and things that were, were that children could understand pretty well. And she would explain what we couldn't. But one of our requirements was that each one of us had to memorize the first and the 23rd Psalm. And I know, of course, it was the King James Version, and I know every word of it still today because we, that it was a must. Not we, a bad idea. <laughs> we had to remember those two psalms. And we would sing a few songs and the boys would hop them. <laughs> and you know, it was the usual thing in all classes, I guess. And of course, it was a cappella, the singing was. And uh, so, but then, Study start at eight o'clock and it ended at 3.30. We would have about a 15 minute recess in mid-morning and afternoon, and then we would get one hour for lunch. We brought our own lunch. About 19.30 or so, Mrs. Hay and Mrs. Stanley, who had children going to the school, uh, started making uh, lunches that we could buy in a small building right out here. I mean, it was just out that way, a ways. And it was real small and it had these flaps that you push up and close up at night and then you lay them and that's where she, they put the lunch. Oh, and uh, they would cook most of it at home because there really was no cooking facilities there. But I never had money to buy the lunch, so I'll, I never, I hardly ever ate there. Uh, because, I mean, Grandma, they had too many kids to buy lunch for. Gloria, how did you bring your lunch? Did you bring it in, in a, a paper yes, sack? In a paper we, sack. Never, we never had a lunch bucket. That, <laughs> that, that was that was too big much. time for the that was big lunch time. Lunch. Kids had those. <laughs> he did carry a, a book satchel. We called it. Yeah, they kind of went around us and hung here and you know it was small just for books and a, you know like a tablet and do you know that I don't remember us ever having homework 
got it all here. We, we got it here. And maybe that they would say, you know, you read a book within a certain, you know, in a two weeks, something like that. But actually, we never did have homework because the people whose children went here, they needed them on the farm. The minute we got home, man, we had to, we had a snack and then we put on our old clothes because you didn't wear clothes, new clothes every day. You wore a dress to school, and then you took it off and put your old clothes on, and then you got busy with the chickens and the cat, and, the, and uh, sometimes you had to go to the field to do certain things. And, I mean, you had a, you worked until it was time for supper. That was your homework. That was our homework. <laughs> I guess that's why they never gave us any at school, because they knew we didn't have time to do it. Uh, so we brought, uh, like I said, we brought, I brought my lunch and some of the other kids, you know, of course, a lot of them bought the lunch or they wouldn't have done this. But then our other access to food was uh, Mr. and Mrs. Joe Deitch. I think it's spelled D-I-E-T-S-T-C-H. Had a store across the road from the school. It was a little bit to the left of Walgreens, about where that um, veterinary mm -hmm. clinic is. It, it wasn't directly from the school, but you had to walk up just a little way. Was it a general store? Yeah, it was a general store. You know, in the olden days, they had the store in the big room in front, and then they had living quarters in the back. And they had a porch, you know, around it two sides around it. I never did go in the back. I'm not sure what was back there, but um, but it was uh, you know just about across the street. And I'll never forget, she had a glass case and she had candy of all kinds in there. And um, oh, we just, we just wanted that candy so bad, but I didn't have, I didn't have money to buy it. But some of the kids would buy it, and once in a while, I would be tempted, and they could charge. Ms. Deitch would charge them for candy, or, well, we could get uh, tablets and stuff like that, over, and pencils and everything over there, too. So she would charge it. So sometimes I would be tempted, and I'd charge it. And then Mama went to Ms. Deitch's store to pick up bread or something. And Ms. Deitch would say, well, Gloria, charge, some can charge something. And oh boy, when I got you home, got I home. really caught it <laughs> because I charged. And, it, and she had sodas. I'm not sure if they were in ice. I mean, in an ice box, you know, we didn't have refrigeration. And I think, and they were in the returnable bottles. And oh, that was so good, the few times that I did get it. They sold groceries and gasoline and um, see by this time, by the time I came along, we had the Model T car. I don't remember buggies and I don't, I mean that was um, earlier than my time. My time was the Model T and you know, our, the first cars and um, so she sold kerosene because you know, a lot of people use kerosene for different reasons. And um, then she, I, I know a man <coughs> that's still living that uh, he, they would keep a couple there and the, la the wife would help her and the husband worked in town. <coughs> and so on Saturday, he would take Mrs. Deach to the city to buy supplies for her, her store for the week. And so some of her, um, I mean, sometimes she would get fruit and vegetables or something. It just depended on what shopping she got to do on Saturday. <coughs> but um, the, uh, she also made like hot dogs and, and sandwiches and stuff. I think that was a little bit kind of before Miss, Miss Hay and Miss Stanley opened this up. And... Um, so I know Burton Brown told me that he, he always, he, his, his mother passed away when he was real small. So his daddy would give him money and he'd always eat at Ms. Deach. So uh, that was before they came in here. 
And this room, when we entered this room, in that door there, there was, they called it a cloak room, right in there. And it was a, just a big closet, like, uh, and we would hang our coat, our lunch, and everything in there. And it wasn't locked or secured. It oh, was just no. open. No, it, uh, it, it was, we just put all our stuff in there. And, um, then we, we had divided desks. You know, some of the older desks like out here are double, but we had our own desk. And, you know, they were nailed down to a board or something. That's right, to a runner. Keep them from falling over. And, and you had to buy them. And, I, well, no, I, I don't remember buying it, but I mean, I guess somebody bought it. But anyway, and we also had a, a great big heater right in that corner there. That was our heat, you know, for the and how was it heated? By wood or? Wood, wood? yeah. Now we had to haul, the boys had to haul the wood in the day before. Of course, in Texas, you don't have a whole lot of cold days, but uh, we did have a lot, have uh, many of them, and they had to haul the wood in the evening before. And, uh, and when the day was over, we had to pick up we had any papers on the floor or anything, the books scattered around or anything, we had to pick up and, and then we had to sweep the floor, not every day, because they would put some of the, some kind of a, oh, a chemical like uh, made with sand or something, and they would throw it around on the floor and that would uh, get down on the dust. Because mm -hmm. you see, all were open all the time. So, you know, they had a lot of dust out there in the, because that was all wide open I can still there. smell that reddish yeah. looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can still smell it. And the floor was wooden. Yeah, <laughs> and it, wherever they dropped it, it would get a little darker for a, a while, wow. you know. But uh, <clears throat> then about every three months or so, I, I don't remember how, how often, we would have cleanup day. And um, and we didn't have any lessons that we just loved cleanup day because we could hop around and have fun and but we had to clean all the windows and and I don't know I, I guess maybe we mopped or did something to the floors and the grounds had to be cleaned up and uh, I mean we just had to get everything cleaned up because there was nobody to do it but us so that was kind of a fun day then during the depression the WPA came in they built a large cement slab right out that way, pretty far out that way. And, um, and we caught, it was an arbor. It had a, a post, I guess, went up and a kind of a screen on it. And on that was palm leaves. Wow. Real, very thick palm leaves, which was our shade. And we loved that arbor because we had, I mean, that's where we did our fun stuff. And next to it, east of it, pretty close to it, uh, this, this, the WPA built a, um, a track, a race track for people, for the students to have races on. You know, it was oval shaped and it was, uh, you know, really a good track. Uh, it, it was made, made, made really good. Anything that they made, they did a good job yeah. of. And that was the Public Works Administration. Yeah, yeah. that uh, uh, Roosevelt got to go in during the uh, Depression. The people where, employed and people working. And, yeah. And this uh, was a track, what was on the track, dirt? Well, yeah, it was kind of a cinder-like. Oh, a stuff. cinder. I mean, it was a, a top it, notch. And it had concrete curbing I, there. And yeah, it had concrete curbing. Wow. And uh, it was re uh, really a good track. And, and uh, we had a baseball field, but I don't know that they had much to do with it. And it was out beyond there, somewhere out in there. But really all it consisted of was uh, a backstop and the bases. They didn't have, a, a, you know, like a, a dugout or, I mean, you know, benches for the kids to sit on or anything. That was you just, just played. It, you just played ball there. And, uh, but they 
we had a lot of good ball players. And so this was kind of the beginning of the Interscholastic League. It was, and then other schools would come and we would uh, run against each other and pole vault and you know, do all of that stuff. So we were the big wigs of the whole district because we had that good track. That's a good track. So they would all want to come At Leon Valley. <laughs> and, but Eddie went to Egu and they also had a pretty good facilities there. Those are the only two uh, rural schools that I remember going to to do anything because they had facilities. But um, but this uh, interscholastic league uh, wasn't also wasn't just in sports. It was also they had spelling bees and art memory and short story writing and music appreciation and they had a variety of things for the students that weren't athletically inclined. We had Mr. Terrell Gates was our teacher at that time and he was really in on sports. And also we had a 4-H club was formed during my later years in school. And I think that we had the first stock show in Bear County that I know right here in this yard. Wow. Because Gates got this to going, the first big stock show. And they brought, it, it was almost all calves and cows. Because by this time, all of these farms here had gone into the dairy business because you, know, you just couldn't hardly make it on the farm anymore. I mean, just farming. And so they had gone into the dairy business, so they were getting, trying to get good stock. So they brought uh, the here and, uh, and the neighboring, all the neighboring uh, rural schools brought their stock. stock and they yeah. had, boy, they put out ribbons and they had, they didn't, I don't think they had trophies. They just had, if you got a blue ribbon, you was really was uptown. First place. So, uh, so really, I think that Leon Valley ought to be honored by having the first stock show, and we know how popular they are now. Really popular. And um, so that was a first. Um, as I said, most of the farmers in this area, a lot of the farmers had gone into the dairy business and um, just to kind of make a living because now, you know, we had we had learned about telephones, and see, I I just um, we didn't have a telephone, we didn't have electricity. How did uh, you light the home? Did you light we, it by kerosene? Kerosene yeah. lamp. And then, of course, if 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 you wanted to read or anything, you had to close the doors because the wind would blow the lamp out. So there you'd sit and sweat with the lamp. <laughs> with the lamp burning in front of you, with the doors shut. <laughs> so it wasn't a very, uh, I, I may mention that later, but I think during, I'm 87 years old, and I think that the greatest invention in my time has been when I was about 12 years old and came home and that uh, wire was hanging down with the bulb in it, and we pulled that little thing. Well, no, it was then. It was you had to turn. Little click on. You had to click it. When they turned that light on, I, that was the best thing that ever happened in my life. Because you don't realize what you can do with electricity now. That uh, and us firsthand. But getting back to our our grounds out here, we had a basketball court. But it was caliche, and so, well, really, all they had was a pole with a basket on it, you know. And they might took a little bit of something and made a court out of it. You mean made the lines for a court? So we didn't have much of a basketball court, but we had a team. Played one one time. I remember they didn't have enough boys to play, so Dorothy Wright, Dorothy Tietze, she was a good athlete, and she she played with them. Because she was pretty good. She was a good athlete. Uh, then after, uh, are there, do you have any more questions about the school itself? Uh, 
was Bandera Road paved at that time? Yeah, it was paved. paved. Yeah. And Grissom, was it paved? There was no Grissom. No Grissom. There was no okay. Grissom Road. There was no Poss Road. There was no Road. There was no Eckert Road. There was no, um, oh, what's the road that HEB is on? <laughs> I can't think of it. <laughs> Gilbo? Gilbo Road. There was no Gilbo Road. Gilbo Road was just a, uh, my, my husband had a Jeep and we, we would go up there to see deer because there was always so many deer up in there. So there was just a little dirt road that came from up there on the Tetzel Road and you could go there and so we would, and it was all downhill, so he would turn the motor off and we would just roll down that hill, you know, and you would see deer, you couldn't imagine how many deer you'd see there. So that was no, no public road at all. We just made it. Where did you get water here at Leon Valley over there? We had a well. Had a well? But uh, over at Ever School, they did not have a well. You had to go to the neighbor and get a bucket full of water for the kids to drink. Of course, they had the outdoor toilet and things, so they didn't need a whole lot of water. But we had well here. Um, then it seems like the nurses would come out once in a while and get, and and give you a vaccination and you know I mean I guess they kind of kept up with uh, the medical requirements of that day which were very limited the only uh, vaccination that I ever remember having was for smallpox smallpox and so we all got the measles we all got the mumps we all got the chicken pox we had all of those diseases you know in the school because there was no prevention and then with the big families, when one came home with it, well, then we just passed it down to one to the other. And if one had it at home, likely the kids here at school would. Yeah, so they, we just brought it back and forth. <laughs> but uh, I remember uh, when um, Charlie Kuhn moved into this area when he was about maybe the third grade or so. So his first day coming to school, he dressed, I mean, his mama made him wear a suit. He was going to be top notch, you know. When he got to school here, all the boys were barefooted with overalls on. So he chucked his suit. Not, and not coveralls, it, but overalls. Yeah, yeah, overalls. And he chucked his suit, and he he was one of the gang after that. But they really made a lot of fun of him. <laughs> we we just had more land, you know, here. I mean, for all of the, that stuff we had back here. We, we had more land for it. And uh, of course, um, there were no houses. You didn't see any houses except the old Hemeronian house. When you went up that road, all the other farmers were you know, off to the side of the road somewhere. You could, couldn't see the houses. And uh, uh, Leon Creek uh, didn't have any bridge, any even have a cement slab in it. Just you, just, you just went through it. It was just a low water crossing and it, luckily it is stone, you know, instead of um, this creek is dirt. Dirt creek. You get bogged in this That's one. But you, creek and but uh, the Leon Creek had this good bottom to where most of you but when it flooded, when it flooded you couldn't go through. How high have you seen Leon Creek? Oh, up? pretty high. But it, you know, it wasn't real often. Of course, they'd go through it when it, you know, of course those old Model T's were so high that they could go through it, where now I don't know whether you could, but um, of course that thrilled me when it went up because all the people we knew that were on this side came to our house because we were, uh, Grandpa's place was on both sides of Leon Creek. And uh, so then they would come to our house. Poor grandma, she had nine kids and then she had all those people to feed. <laughs> oh. But we had fun because they usually had kids with them, you know. And uh, so uh, it, it was just a different world. <laughs> As time went on, we still didn't have, Grissom Road is a pretty new road. Uh, Rimpkus, Raymond Rimpkus, for whom the park is named, 
in Leon Valley now. He had his store right next door here, just a little way down, you know, in an open field. And so he opened that store in the, uh, the detour burned. And then they left. I think maybe that Mr. Deach had already died by then, but it seems like it was probably about 1940 um, or something, I mean, 30, late 30s, when the, oh, the beach store burned down, and so then Raymond Rimkus opened this store on this side of the road. And it was a general store. And it was a general store. He had cloth and pots and food, and he had his, he would, he had a half of a beef, and then he would put it out on the table and cut off cut what you off. want. And he you know, had the glass case where you could pick what you wanted to, but uh, he, he was the first mayor of Leon Valley. When Leon Valley was established, well, he was the first mayor. So that's why the park is, uh, over there is named after him. So, uh, that was a tough time. What made it tough? Well, because a lot of people were against it. They didn't want their taxes going up for a high school. They didn't have any kids in high school. I don't want to, I'm voting against it. And so, it, it was... How did it pass? How man, did the, I'll tell how, you. Who we, worked on it to oh, get it through? Oh, uh, Clarence Gollum. Clarence Gollum. He was the one that he, and he had John Floor in Helotus, a paper. And he, he, I, we still have some of his articles that he wrote in favor of this. Is that right? And it was, it was a tough time, man. I'll tell you, there were a lot of people were against it. No, <clears throat> they were against it. Where, <clears throat> where did they send their kids for high well, school? Well, most of them already had kids. I mean, their kids were gone. Already gone. So, uh, and if they, they did, they them. were going to Jefferson. Yeah, then, at that yeah, time? yeah. That's what to me. And also, my brother uh, came to this school. He was two years behind me, Richard McCullough. He was a good athlete and a good student and a happy-go-lucky guy. And uh, a, really a fun person. And, uh, anyway, he came, he was about two years behind me. And he went to Jefferson, and he, he was even, he got a Jackson for his something, shot put or something, yes, I don't know right. what it was. And he, he did real well. But, um, you know, remember, this is still, still the economy is bad. So when he graduated from there, he went to work for a mobile dealer to help deliver gasoline. Yes, right. to Like our garage right. and different places. And um, then he went to work as uh, he learned, um, well, some trade. Can you think of it? Sheet metal. Sheet metal. Sheet okay. metal. He learned that trade pretty well. Then he went to work at Kelly Field. And you see, the war is on by now. World War II. Yeah, World War II. So he was transferred to Albuquerque, New Mexico. He, he got married, and he was transferred to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And so Eddie and, uh, and I decided, well, we'd just go out to New Mexico. So we, we went out there and got a sort of partner, and we had a lot of fun together. We you know, went in the mountains, and we did a lot of things together. And I think the Lord just put us together because he knew what was coming up. But uh, on uh, July 18th, 1943, he had he'd gotten into the Navy because he was about to get drafted. So he got into the Navy and they sent him out to California for basic training. He was sent to uh, Florida, Pensacola, Florida, where he was on uh, with the airplanes. And he was uh, a flight engineer on a plane with seven other men. They went over the Bermuda Triangle and disappeared. Never found a thing from that point. They looked for three days for oil slicks or, or just, you know, thought they would find them. 
and they never found not, nothing. So he was pronounced dead at the not age the plane, 22. Not the plane, not a person. Yeah, nothing. not nothing. They, uh, it was a big plane, but they never found a thing. And so, uh, you know, later he was pronounced dead on that day at age 22. 22. And, so, and y'all were in Albuquerque then? No, or, no, we, that, he, he, after he moved there, we stayed in Albuquerque about two or three more months, and then we just, we want to go home. Being they weren't there, well, sure. we, we, then we came, and we bought the place, we bought a place on uh, Sawyer Road when we came back from on there. Sawyer Road. Okay. We lived on Sawyer Road for many years. Um, getting back to the uh, consolidation, but, but one thing about uh, my brother, um, he was the only one that gave his life in World War II uh, that was a student of this, thank God. I mean, that there weren't others, but we were wishing it wouldn't have been any. Um, so get back to this consolidation. Uh, Mr. Haggard and his father-in-law is the one that gave the land, gave the land for the school. And uh, we had to really, we had to really work to get people to agree in the election to do this. And do you know, I think, now I may be wrong, but it seems to me like we even had an election to dissolve the consolidation. I don't know, I may be wrong, but I... Uh, we'll check that out. You check it out sometime. Oh, it, 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 it was pretty, pretty tough going. And uh, so, but thank goodness it finally, we finally did do it. Clarence Gum and John Flora and other people yeah. had a lot to do with yeah, they, consolidating. Uh, Clarence Gum, he went from door to door begging people to vote for this and it did pass and but he gave the John Floor a lot of the credit because he had the advantage of uh, the printed material that went to the homes. We built uh, North Side High School which was wonderful and uh, of course we did they didn't have money to to make a football field or anything all the daddies got out there, and um, Mr. Ott was an electrician. That's right. So That's he right. climbed the poles, and we put in the lights, and um, put in a haphazard-like bleachers, and we had football games, but the school, I mean, the school wouldn't pay for any of it, so we, we had to do our own at the beginning. And, but we had a lot of fun. We had a little shack back there, and we made hamburgers and right. hot dogs. And we <laughs> had your own concession stand. We had our concession stand, and we just, that's how we paid for a lot of that stuff. Uh, so then by the, by the time my children got here to Leon Valley, which David and Karen both started in the first grade here, they had gotten a white building. They always called it the white school. White building. I've heard it's school. So out that way, they built a white school, and that's where Karen went. She said she never did really go to school in this building, and I know, don't know that David did. I think they stayed in the white buildings, whatever that is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we had, I mean, I did a lot in the PTA, and, you know, all that stuff for the kids. And um, uh, then, all of my grandchildren, by, by this time, we had indoor bathrooms. So that was a big group by that, by that time. Almost as important electricity. Oh man, that but was not really quite. <laughs> not, not quite, electricity beat it all. But, uh, uh, but all of my grandchildren went to Leon Valley School at some time. Now, uh, uh, David, our son, lived in Saudi Arabia when his two children were in school. But when his son got old enough to have to be sent, you, they, they had a private school there, but when they got to be in the eighth grade, well, then they had to send them somewhere in Europe to board and go to school because they did not have that in Saudi Arabia. So when Mark got to that age, well, then they moved back 
to Texas because they didn't want to do that. Uh, so all of my grandchildren went to Leon Valley School. Now Karen's daughters, I don't think they went to Leon Valley. They went to one of the other north side schools over that way, just a little ways. But anyway, it, they all ended up graduating from either, David graduated from north side and all of them graduated from John Marshall, except David's youngest daughter. Uh, she went to her freshman year there and then they bought the ranch in Dilly. And so when they moved, well, she finished school at Dilly. I'll be. But she did attend, all of them attended the North Side, uh, you know, at one, one time or another. But all the rest of them graduated from there. Um, let's see. Um, you had on your list the pronunciation of right. names. Talking to Garnet Stubing, he said, well, ask Gloria about how you pronounce Stubing and Lumel and some of these other dramatic names. Yeah. Because he says they're always being mispronounced. <laughs> yeah. Well, when first came to, uh, to America, I guess, um, see, one, one thing that gets things kind of fouled up, when you arrived in America, well, they, here was some Irishman or something <laughs> writing down your name when you <laughs> came across. When they, they came to Galveston, um, they were on the ship, I think three weeks or a month, uh, getting, and they, they landed in Galveston. In, in what, r roughly what year? Was that around the 1850s? 18, yeah, I think I had it. Yeah, you yeah, had it I early. had it over here. Yeah, you, you had it early. Yeah, uh, anyway, when, when you land, well, this guy is here and writes your name down. Well, he was, he's an Irishman. He doesn't know Stoibe. I mean, he doesn't know how to pronounce, I mean, he doesn't get the pronunciation of the, the German. You know, so he just writes it down, and so it ends up being a little bit different than what your name was, but you take it because you you have it. But uh, anyway, getting back to the pronunciation of Stubing, the first pronunciation was Stoibing. Yeah, there's a lot of sh in, in the German language. So they called it Stoibing. Then later, especially I could just hear Mr. Gates uh, you know, he, he'd always, Mr. Stiby, Sty, he Stiby. had the I, I. Uh, it sounded like an I instead, instead of, of an e. R. E. E. Okay. E. Yeah. He called it Stiby. So a lot of people called it Stiby. Well, it's really spelled S-T-E-U, which is stupid. So the younger generation then, we, we got it back to where it, uh, it's pronounced like it's spelled. We think. Like it, like it's spelled. Yeah, we and, think. And Blue Mel? Yeah, that, that, that was Blemo. 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 And Brown, Brown Road, Brown Station. We always pronounce that word Brown, just like a B R O W N. But when they started the Brown Station subdivision, they called it Braun, B-R-A-U-N is the way it's really spelled. But they, the, the family, Brown. Brown. Brown Hall. Brown, Brown Hall and Brown Road. And of course, there's a lot of Brown family. So uh, that, that was uh, the way we pronounced it. Well, what, what do you remember about uh, the Bacons? How did the Bacons well, uh, the bacon, play in this? Uh, the Bacons, you see, they were over at Lock Hill. Okay. See, they weren't in this school district. I mean, in, in our school district. They were in the They were in the Lock Hill Elementary. But, of course, we, we knew them slightly. But then when Raymond dated Bernice Bacon, and they live over there on DeZavala and uh, the uh, Babcock. Babcock area. 
So that was just like another world because <laughs> they didn't even have a road that went over from the farm over to Babcock. They, they, <clears throat> but then they finally had a kind of a dirt road that you could go through somebody's place and get over there. So Raymond found that place real quick when he started dating Bernice. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, things were not so far away, but if you don't have roads to get there, well, it gets pretty far before you do it. And the Krugers or Kriegers or yeah. Yeah, they how were, are they kin to you? Krieger, uh, the Kruger, Mrs. Kruger, that is the mother of Lester and Junie and them, she was my grandpa's niece. See, she was my grandpa's brother's daughter. And that, she married a... And she married a Kruger. Kruger. From New Brownfields. See, this Charles Kruger, my grandpa's brother, who also came, you see, there, there was a bunch of them came to Leon Valley with the old grandpa. And he had his place, his beautiful rock house is still right behind um, Grady's. That's where his house is. And it was his daughter that married the Kruger farther back toward Tetzel Road. And uh, so that's where the Krugers came in. Okay, one of the Krugers uh, that I remember is Curtis yeah. and his younger brother. See, in those days, uh, they usually married uh, 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 all of Grandpa's sisters and brothers married a Reininger, except Grandpa and one brother. They all married Reiningers. I guess they ran out of Reiningers when my young grandpa came, well, they didn't have any more left. Anyway, then he married, uh, um, he, he married out of the Reininger family and, and the, uh, Charles across the road. He married a Sauer, where my uh, grandpa married him. Dean Kruger. Yeah, <laughs> that's dumb. Got to see him in church. Um, so Dean is really the grandchild of my grandpa's niece. I mean, that's how the connection is. You know, in our family, you can be 10th cousin and you're still cousin. Tell me about the Otts. Well, the Otts kind of came into the picture with the Rimpel family, you know, the, I, the old Rimpel family that, um, that well, their old house is still there on 1604 in Brown Road. Okay. Uh, that, his, their daughter married Ott. Now the Otts came to San Antonio, he and his brother. I don't know where they lived in San Antonio, but they had connections out here, but I don't know their connections. But then he, one of them married um, a Rimple girl, and the other one married a, a brown girl. So you see, then they got connected with everybody out here because everybody was kin to them. Spell Rempel for? R-E-U-M-P-E-L, I think. Okay. But that's where the Otts came to the picture because they married a daughter. What was there a relationship uh, through marriage uh, between the Otts and the Goms? Well, uh, the... the The Goms, um, their mother, no, uh, the Ga the the Rimple daughter married a Gom, and then it was her her offspring that the, the all these Goms okay. came from, but she was a Rimple. Because I remember Paul Ott lived on a, an area out there off of Petranca Road, yeah. Hunt Lane in that yeah. area, I think. I think the Goms had some problems. Yeah, they, they did. They, uh, they did. They, they lived there. Does, does the name Mossberg ring a bell? Yeah, Mal there was a Maltisberger and a Mossberger that we know. The Mossberger that we knew ran the store, the old, old, 
rock store in the downtown Helotus. I mean, an old Helotus. That was that was the main road. I mean, we didn't have the new road. I mean, you went through Helotus every, or wherever you went. That was the road. And so he uh, ran that sh uh, store there. And uh, and Maul Fisberger had a dairy back here off of Sawyer Road. Off of Sawyer. Okay. Yeah. See. Well, they, I think it was during that period is when they put Grissom Road in. So, you know, he was had a dairy back in here. And they were real active in the school. But then they both died. And the Knowltons, does that? Yeah, they, I knew of them quite a bit, but I, I wasn't, um, I mean, I, I not, not well. I didn't know them well. I, you know, know that they owned the place that, uh, that the, uh, Russo's lived on, uh -huh. and they bought it from him and so forth. I, I know of them, but not real well. But uh, another thing that I failed to say about the Leon Valley School, the judge went into this house, the old uh, Hebner house, and he had twin boys. And so those boys came to school here. They were in the first grade over there when I was over here in about the eighth grade, you know. But we, we went to school together. And so those two never did, never did learn to tell them apart. That's Cause right. She, Cause she dressed them the same and, and they looked the same. Cause well, I never was close enough to them. You know, they were so far behind me that I didn't pay much attention. Were they still wearing old that day? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, so, so the Onions bought what was the Hebner house. Yeah, yeah, that was the old Hebner place. And where the stagecoach stop was. Grandpa told me, you know, a lot about Mr. Hebner. And, um, I mean, you know, he knew him well. And um, he, he had the stagecoach stop here. And Grandpa, you know, told me quite a bit about it. In, in the stagecoach, they had what, food, food and water? And horses, most of them. Horses, okay. Uh, they'd have to change they'd horses. Trace. So I think they would leave their tired horse and he would give them a fresh horse to get to San Antonio. You see, these roads are all cut down now, but this a hill right here a next to, it was a tough hill. You had to go through this creek and then go straight up that hill. And it, it was a bad hill. There's quite a few. Now, you see the old, old Bandera Road went the, the old way until you get to, to Loop 410. Then Bandera Road made a curve, and that is now Evers Road. Evers. That's what went into San Antonio. There was no straight road, because my cousin owned that property. He had the farm there. Okay. And, and so- and their name was? Their, their name was uh, Ronnie. Okay. So that, that was the old road. Was part of that old road is still up there where uh, Lida Company had their office. You could, you'd get off Bandera. In fact, oh. when I was driving a bus out here, I would move over to the old Bandera Road to pick up students on the way to Marshall. Yeah. And it was much higher than Bandera Road proper, the old Bandera Road. Yeah. And then you joined it. I think the Binkies lived up there. I can't. Oh yeah, I don't, I don't know. But you see, um, most people don't realize that the Bandera, they think Bandera Road went straight in. That was not the case. It, it made Took a, a little turn. detour. <laughs> you, you went around the farms. You didn't go through them like we do now. You kind of went around the farm and that's how that got the bend in it, was to go on up and then hit the old Evers. When did the Burns come to this area to uh, do some farming and dairying? Let's see, when did my grandpa die? Oh, I need my book. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they bought, uh, when, when grandpa died, well, Burns bought his farm from okay. the heirs. Right. And so they, uh, of course, been living here a long time, but that was a go, let me see. Grandpa died in about, uh, I, I'm bad at 
at Remembrance that, that, Gates. Fine, and um, but they bought the far farm, and the old house is still there. I mean, they they redid it, but it's still part of the old grandpa's old house. Do you, do you remember uh, the folks that would have lived off of? now around 1604 and houseman named Ewald. Ewald. I've heard of them, but I didn't heard. know them. Uh, they went to Lock Hill, I think. Uh, yeah. yeah, you see, right in that area, they, that, those kids went to Lock Hill. And, um, but uh, I don't know how far we went out. Well, some of the kids that lived almost in Hell Otis came here to school Maybe. at different times. Because they there was the old Calabra school over on the road. And they were just about like this school. But you know, they didn't have a racetrack. They didn't have a <laughs> running track. They didn't have a racetrack. Okay, <laughs> there was Los Reyes. Do you remember that? Yeah, I, I know of it, but I don't actually And remember. Leon Springs. Yeah, the, I, and, I remember that. And of course, Helotis. And, and Lock Hill. Lock Hill. And Calabra. And Calabra. And Clifton, I think. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think we're yeah. one of them. And, and another thing that most people don't realize here is we had a colored school. And that colored school was up, oh, up in, we call it Woodlawn Hills. West back San up there. West San Antonio High, sir. Yeah. Sure it, Woodlawn. And uh, so. Of course, once in a while, we would they would take us to the colored school. You know, I mean, I don't know whether it was classes or the... Uh, competition? Or sing. We never had competition with them. And uh, we would go there and, you know, maybe sing or something, and they would serve refreshments. And, and we tried to integrate some, but of course, in those days, that was frowned upon. I mean, you know, I was, I'm surprised they even took us there. Gloria, this, this has been really nice. You're, you're a historian for Zion Lutheran Church. <laughs> Try to be. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's just what Northside Museum Association is trying to do is to capture as much of the history. And just talking to you has it, just been uh, very important in this whole effort to capture in a, in a capsule this history. Uh, what, do, you, do you remember how uh, much the consolidation area uh, effort passed by? Was it uh, a couple of hundred votes or? Oh yeah, well yeah, there weren't a whole lot of votes. Everyone ran really crowded, but uh, I, I just remember it just being a pretty tough time. And another thing that I, I've kind of failed to mention was, you see, we came out of this little, little school and then they pushed us in Jefferson High School. Boy, talk about a little fish in a big pond. I was that fish, because I was really not a good student. I mean, I, I didn't learn fast. And uh, uh, most of them did very well there, but uh, I'll tell you, I think we, we just weren't, uh, weren't ready for, for what we were getting for Jefferson. Ready. For Jefferson, man, it was tough going. When I wasn't lost, I was <laughs> something else was going wrong. How did you get to jail? Well, we had the bus picked us up. Uh, the bus driver would take us there. Of course, it was all pasture. There was nothing there but the school setting up there on the hill. And uh, the boys would uh, hide in the bushes. And then the bus driver would honk and honk for them to come. And then when they left, well, here they'd come out of the bushes and then laugh and laugh, laugh. and the bus driver could have just <laughs> knocked their heads off. <laughs> <laughs> so there was always tricky kids in the whole bunch. Now, you mentioned Eddie a while ago. Where, where'd you meet Eddie? Uh, on a blind date. On a blind date. Yeah. Now, Eddie is your husband of... Uh, we're we're going to be married nine years. 69 years. Congratulations. Thank you. Gloria, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. I've enjoyed doing it.